Thank you. Thank you, Vince, for a very kind introduction. Um, and and to, to Vince, Roger, and All Souls for, for this invitation. Um, I'm hugely honoured to speak at a symposium in honour of Roger's work and to follow on from people like Paul Collier, whose work I've admired for a long time, and Tim Besley, who was my dissertation advisor, along with Teddy Brett, more years ago than I, I care to remember. Um, on that note, if, if, there's, if there are any mild objections or certainly praise to anything that I have to say, please do let me know. And if you have s really stringent objections, you should probably let Tim know. <laughs> so, um, I wanted to, so this is, this is based on a book that, that was published last year, um, there you see the title. Um, it's a culmination of 15 years of research on decentralization and local government. My research has gone beyond the case of Bolivia, but the book really focuses on Bolivia and tries to be a, a deep study of decentralization in one particular country um, with blended qualitative and quantitative methods. I wanted to show you a website just because we've been talking a lot about data, all the speakers have underlined the importance of data and the lack of data in the world for, for sensible comparisons, which we'll talk about again in a moment. I, this, this isn't internet connected. So anyway, let me just say, if you go to my faculty page on the LSE, Department of International Development, it's linked there very clearly. And the, um, that, that website is about to migrate to the, the middle one just called Governance from Below. The reason why some people, especially graduate students, might have an interest in that is that I've, I've put up all of the databases that I used over the last 15 years and it's all available for free download there. So it's just for one country. Uh, sadly, I can't offer you a really brilliant cross-country you know, deep data set of, of, of local characteristics, but I can do so for one country. And we're gonna put up a database that we're currently developing for Colombia alongside that. So if anybody wants to look more deeply into this, it, it, it's all there, as well as interviews, <coughs> videos, and sort of other qualitative stuff. So this is, um, this is the plan of what we're going to do. I want to talk, start out talking about more general issues of decentralization and, and what we know and don't know about decentralization before I go down to decentralization in Bolivia at, at a, a sort of a meso level and talk about what happened in one country broadly and then dig down even deeper and look at lo local governance in a couple of the cases that I studied, which is just two for lack of time. I, I looked at 10 case studies and all. Um, but I want to try to dig down to the local political economy of what worked and didn't work in local governance in these two places. So first of all, decentralization is, as, as most of you know, I'm sure, a, a huge policy movement. Tim alluded to this just now, and one of the most contentious issues in development over the last generation or so, in that there are, there, there are very big claims and very big counterclaims made in favor and against. The World Bank in 1999 estimated that between 80 and 100% of the world's countries were experimenting with some form of decentralization reform. <coughs> Excuse me. Since then, an additional 20 or 25 reforms have been, new or deepening reforms have been announced in different countries. Um, it's not just in the developing world, but under different guises. It's called different things in different places, but subsidiarity in the EU, devolution in the UK, federalism or the new, feder the, the new federalism under Reagan in the 1980s in the US and you know, sort of recurrent bouts of federalism in the, in the US since then. It, it's, it's, it's a big thing and it's going on in, uh, in most of the world, if not almost all of the world. It's not just the breadth in terms of the number of countries, but also the depth of decentralization. So Tim Campbell has a study from 2003 that shows that in Latin America, up to 50% of total government revenues were being devolved to subnational levels, to provincial and local levels of government. So up to half of all tax revenues, it's, it's, uh, or all government revenues, tax and borrowing. So it's a lot of money. Um, as, as Tim said, this counters the, a, a broader historical tendency. He gave a more serious account of this. I'm going to give you a broader and more, more cartoonish account, which is to look at a longer stretch of human history and, and look at the, you know, the, the, the ascent of man from hunter-gatherers living in small groups, to settled agriculture, which yields huge productivity gains, and within the margin of 10 to 100 fold productivity gains over hunting and gathering, we see social organization increase in size and grow more complex. And so villages grow into chiefdoms with populations in the thousands. You get centralized hereditary leaderships over a long period of time. And it's difficult to, to infer social characteristics from the fossil record, but people who, who know much more about this than I do, say that this is you know, broadly the pattern over long periods of time. 
Um, we get the first cities and states in Mesopotamia and then elsewhere, Egypt, India, and so on. And they have certain characteristics which are natural to more centralized political forms, not just big populations and many cities and villages with a capital, but centralized decision-making, control of information, sophisticated bureaucracies and religious orders, systems of laws and judges, redistributive taxation. And even when the big polities like the Roman Empire, for example, fractures, these instruments of centralization don't go away. They might, they might, they might become smaller in terms of the territorial scope, but they remain. You still have systems of laws and judges in Italian city-states. You still have sophisticated bureaucracies, religious orders, etc. Um, so, so now the, the big wave of decentralization that really happens in the world in the last 50 years or so um, counters that very broad tendency. It's, it may be empirically slightly surprising, but theory provides some strong reasons for thinking that this might be a good thing to happen. <coughs> now, there are lots of theoretical arguments, and I have another slide that we can get to later on if there's interest. There, there are probably 12 reasons in, in favor and five to six reasons against. The kind of thing that Dan Treisman goes through in, in his book on the architectural federalism. I want to focus on just three arguments which I think are key, which I think are the core of the argument in favor of decentralization. And then the question is, do these operate or not? Because I think other arguments are largely subsidi subsidiary to this argument in the sense that whether it makes government more corrupt or not, or it makes decentralization, makes microeconomics, uh, sorry, macroeconomic stability um, increase or decrease is a, a subservient question to this question, which has to do with information participation and accountability on the supply side, the supply side of government, um, or supply side of policy, if you like. And we can take those three together and call that deepening democracy. Um, and on the demand side, a very simple sort of mechanical relationship, that is that if you take any government, uh, any country with any level of heterogeneity, when you talk about a smaller unit of local government or provincial government, that will tend to be relatively more homogeneous and so easier to supply public goods for. The public goods provision problem in a more homogeneous context is easier to solve than in a more heterogeneous context. Right, a very simple sort of argument. The more interesting argument is the supply side about information participation and accountability. And so if this is true, this gives us a, a fairly strong theoretical reason for thinking that all else equal decentralization should lead to better quality of governance, more responsive government um, that meets local needs um, better and then may have second order effects along the lines of, of economic growth, for example. The empirical literature strangely doesn't agree or has not yet been able to substantiate this convincingly, especially when we talk about the big cross-country studies or big international comparisons, which may be qualitative but look to compare different countries' performance. And I'm just going to give you a very brief taste of this. These are some surveys that were done explicitly to try to find out, you know, what do we know at different points in time. So lit back et al. in 1998 find that one can prove or disprove almost any proposition about decentralization by throwing together different sets of data or different case studies. What do you want to know? I can, wh what do you want to say? I can prove that. Tell me what you want to say and I'll gather the data that makes that point. You want to say the opposite? I can do that too. Shah Thompson and Zhu in 2004, trying to update this explicitly, show that decentralization sometimes improved, other times worsened service delivery, corruption, macro stability, and growth across a range of 56 countries. So they're looking at stuff from new literature from 1998, which they survey, and they find a similar degree of indeterminacy. Um, and Dan Treisman, that Roger mentioned, is that the most damning of all. He finds the results inconclusive, weak, and contradictory, and says, quote, today there are almost no solidly established general empirical findings about the consequences of decentralization. This leaves us in a strange paradox, because on the one hand, there are some theoretical reasons which, if true, should give us a good rationale for doing this. It appears that countries are experimenting all over the world, real policy experiments that are basically spanning the globe, and yet empirically we can't say anything despite a literature that is literally hundreds of published studies in academic journals, and if you include the policy gray literature, things like reports and studies from the World Bank, the IMF, um, some of the bigger NGOs, country governments, you know, um, ministries of finance or planning, for example, the number sends into the thousands of what I would call you know, reasonably serious studies, 
and they're as indeterminate as this. So it leaves us in a very strange situation. <coughs> I think this is due to three things. On the one hand, there's, there's a fairly simple but deep conceptual confusion in the empirical literature on decentralization about what decentralization is. This is, this is most obvious in the older literature that goes back to the 1970s and 80s, where you typically begin with a taxonomy of decentralization, different kinds of decentralization, as if they were flavors of ice cream. There can be deconcentration, delegation, devolution or privatization. This is just one taxonomy from Rondinelli et al. in 1983 in a World Bank study that's been much cited in the literature. And this seems to me, that, uh, well, it seems to be wrong and it seems to be deeply misleading because deconcentration and delegation are in effect different ways of tinkering with the centralized state, a unitary state, that don't really change the incentives and so we should not expect to change performance in any systematic way. Privatization is interesting and important but it's just different. It's like comparing beans and bananas. It's something that should be studied in a separate category. Devolution, I'm going to argue henceforth and for the rest of this talk, is, is one good thing that, or sorry, one good definition of decentralization that does change incentives in a systematic way and we should expect to have an effect. And then what that effect is, we, we, can, we can argue about and we can look for uh, evidence about. And so when I talk about devolution, I'm going to define it in a moment, but I'm really talking about democratic devolution from higher to lower levels of government. There's a separate dimension of confusion, which is where is it really implemented? So when the bank says that this is being done in almost every country in the world, possibly bar North Korea, where we don't know what's going on, they're talking about intentions of reform or laws or executive decrees in black and white that have been approved. This is very different from real reform being promulgated and, and implemented. You know? And so it's after spending a long time sort of waiting around in this literature, it seems to me that very many countries that have said they're decentralizing really haven't for the simple reason, which is what I've, I've alluded to in one or two papers as the black hole at the, at the center of this decentralization debate, which is why would anybody do it? <coughs> By definition, decentralization must be, especially if we call, if we're referring to democratic devolution, by definition, it's central government authorities who hold power and resources in their hands, handing it down to lower level officials who, if they're democratically elected, cannot be directly controlled. They might be influenced, their, their party relationships, their, their bureaucratic incentives, but they have their own mandate, and so the president or the prime minister cannot in instruct them in what to do, like he could before. Why would any president or prime minister do this? So it seems to me that many countries go along with it. It's a fashion that seems popular. Maybe it's a conditionality for getting some money, or it, it will, somehow it has some sort of benefits public or private to the leaders, but then they don't really implement it. And even if the president really wants to do it, the entire centralized bureaucracy is against him or her and will start a rear guard battle to, under <coughs> excuse me, to undermine the decentralization <coughs> Sorry, once, it, once the law has been approved. And so in most countries where it's proclaimed, real decentralization doesn't happen. So the first thing we need to do is control for what type of decentralization, focus, or, or better yet, use a restrictive definition um, that isolates one of what has been referred to, one kind of decentralization, and then secondly, look at where it has really been promulgated, and then, and only then, start to characterize what the effects are. Secondly, um, Roger asked me to mention the, the what? Can I just ask you? Yes. Question. All the empirical studies look at the average effect of decentralization. Yeah. Yet it's not clear that Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, no, I'm going to get to that in a moment. I think it's absolutely right. Um, which actually, it's my bottom thing here, the wrong question. I think the, the literature has largely asked the wrong question. Um, so just, I mean, going on to that, the, 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 this, is, this has begun to change in the last seven to ten years, you know, sort of rounding vaguely. Um, but the way that most of the literature, the vast majority in, in terms of the number of studies have asked this question is, is looking for average effects or expecting it to be a reform that has monotonic effects throughout a country, where it's like flipping a switch. You decentralize is sort of analogous to increasing investment in primary education or a road building project. And then the, the main question is one of efficiency. With what efficiency were the funds used in building lots of schools, 
schools did or did not get built, teachers turned up and gave instruction or did not. It's, it's not a fundamental question about what happened. If you, if you implement a program to build schools, you don't expect to get a lot of village fates and you don't expect to get lots of plumbing systems, right? In decentralization, you don't know what the effect is going to be by, by the very nature of the reform in question, let alone how it's going to, with what level of efficiency it'll operate. Um, and then the, the middle point here is that a lot of the older studies, uh, I would say, are not terribly rigorous. Beginning with the qualitative studies, you have comparisons of three, five, sometimes seven country case studies. So one that tortured me when I was a Tim student ages ago was a study of Mexico, Indonesia, and India. And the, the, the study culminated with a chapter on the 15 reasons why the results had been disappointing in each case, but disappointing in different ways. Well, any sort of study that has you know, three observations and, and, and 15 reasons is a system that can't be resolved, right? I mean, in effect, those 15 reasons are speculation. Um, quantitative studies solve this, but at a high cost, which has been referred to earlier today, in the sense that our data sets just don't control for the kinds of things that we should expect to affect decentralization results. There are lots of institutional, legal, and political details, which are, which are not details, are actually quite important in the way that different countries operate, um, that we just don't have good data for. If we had good data for this, th this is not a, an objection of principle. If we had good data, then it would be possible to deal with this, but we don't have good data. So the, the solution that I've tried to implement in this study is first a restrictive definition. So I'm going to define decentralization as democratic devolution of particular functions to lower levels of government where those governments are substantially or no, substantively independent within a particular geographic and functional domain. So the central government says primary, go primary education is henceforth the responsibility of local governments and each local government can run primary education in that locality. And then you know, that's what's going to happen. Um, and deconcentration, privatization, um, uh, and the other sort of form forms of reform that are possible are, are being ruled out. Secondly, empirical rigor is what I mentioned before, hopefully rigor, but in any event, an attempt through blended qu quantitative and qualitative analyses, um, large n in one country, meaning I'm going to have a database with all the municipalities in Bolivia, the universe of, of municipalities, people, and space, um, supplemented by qualitative case studies where I go and spend months and months in a number of different places and try to dig down into the social mechanisms behind the decisions that get made and then combine the two things in a way that hopefully is better than either one can, can tell us alone. And lastly, this is Tim's point, the right question. I hope it's the right question. It seems o obvious to me that the answer to the question, is decentralization good for primary health, is yes, of course it's good for primary health. You know, if a country decentralizes, primary health will undoubtedly improve in some places. And the obvious answer to the question, is it bad for primary health, is yes, of course, it's also bad for primary health. In other places, primary health will, will get worse. And there's an, another range of places where it won't get better or worse, they'll sort of muddle along. Because the, the outputs of decentralization aren't average effects or aren't, aren't similar across a range of very different localities within a country, it's the aggregation of lots of local political and institutional dynamics that differ as much as any given place differs from any other place in a country, and most developing countries are very diverse. I mean, probably most countries are very diverse, but certainly most developing countries are very diverse. And so to understand decentralization, we have to first understand how local government works and then w analytically work our way upwards. So let me talk about decentralization in Bolivia. What did the Bolivians do? The decentralization program there was, uh, I argue it was radical and sincere. It was radical because it was unexpected. A few technicians got in, um, got into a room together and over a period of a couple of months hashed out this program and the president launched it on an unexpected country. More importantly, it was sincere in that they really did it. Um, and there's an interesting contrast between the Bolivian and the Colombian case in terms of the budget, the fiscal implications, which we might get to later on if there's interest. What did they do? There are four major points. One is that resource allocation changed from a strict per capita, sorry, from a strictly from a, from a non-strict political criterion that's sort of difficult to characterize. I'm calling it political because it's tough to tell, but if it, we'll, we'll look at some data in a moment, and you see that a few places got all the money and most places got nothing. Um, and it seems that which places got the money, uh, which were the part of the small coalition of municipalities that got 
the lion's share of the money varied with political coalitions and with where the president's mother happened to live, that kind of thing. But it was very unsystematic, and so I'm, it, I'm gonna call it political. It changed to a per capita criterion, and the total pie doubled. So total resources devolved, went from 10 to 20% of the, of the national budget, but more importantly, the, it switched to a per capita criterion. Um, secondly, they devolved services that are along the lines of what you would expect. So primary education, primary health care, local irrigation, local roads, not trunk roads, not major you know, provincial irrigation systems, but small local things, um, and so on and so forth. And ownership of this infrastructure was just handed over to municipal governments. Thirdly, they established oversight committees. We've talked about in, in different guises, traditional leaders or, or the sort of civic organizations that tend to exist in some places um, by which communities relate to one another, govern themselves, solve collective action problems, organize you know, local festivals, yearly festivals, or whatever. The, the reform was explicitly designed to incorporate these forms of civic organizations and legitimacy into the local governance system, such that the oversight committee had a parallel stature to the municipal government. It had a, uh, the committee was parallel to the council, the president of the committee was parallel to the mayor in, in terms of legal stature, and the Oversight Committee could freeze all central disbursements to the municipal government if they disagreed with how the money was being spent because they, they thought that there was corruption or they simply didn't agree with the priorities. And that would effectively paralyze many rural municipalities that had a small tax base. Fourthly, municipalization. In Bolivia at the time, only 100 municipalities of 300 plus in ex post existed even in a, in a, a, a minor league sense, in a minimal legal, legal sense, um, and of those, only about 20, 25 functioned in any sort of administrative sense. In the other 70, you had a nominal mayor who might cut the ribbon at, a, at an opening ceremony or preside over the, the village fete, but didn't have an office, didn't have a budget, didn't have any people who worked for him or her. Um, so they, they created real municipalities, and uh, they created 200 new municipalities, and they beefed up the ones that, that existed before, and they expanded all of them to include rural catchment areas, such that the whole country was included in one or another municipality. So what happened? Again, this is just descriptive to, to see, you know, it's possible that nothing happened. It's possible that the country was run well or badly before and well or badly after, and you don't have much of a change. Um, so this is, a, as a simple revealed preference argument, the dark bars are what central government did during the seven years before reform, and the yellow bars are what local governments did, excluding continuing central government investment. So this is investment versus investment. The yellow bars are what local governments invested in after the reform. And so, as a, as a sort of broad descriptive, you can see that central government preferred or prioritized transportation, hydrocarbons, energy and this multi-sectoral, which is a grab bag of the leftovers. Local governments after reform prioritize education, urban development, water and sanitation, <coughs> transport and health. This urban development goes down after the first few years quite precipitously because urban development means basically building up some offices for the mayors to work out of because most municipalities had no offices, had no structure, no, 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 not, not a building or a room, let alone a computer or lights or anything like that. Um, so, you know, at first they needed some, somewhere to work, and then after that, a lot of this money gets churned back into education, water, and health in particular in, in later years. Were hydrocarbons and transport long-term infrastructure investments, or were they, would, it, would this be representative of what the central government would have continued to do year, year after year? Some of it, transport, yes, hydrocarbons, no, because the other thing they did was to privatize the hydrocarbon sector. So this is, I mean, this, I'm not making any claims based on this other than just to, to describe what, what happened before and after. There was a separate reform that the same government did, which was, they called um, uh, capitalization of the state enterprises, which was basically a, a large-scale privatization. So they got out of the hydrocarbons business. So there couldn't have been a yellow bar for hydrocarbons? There, there sort of wouldn't have been anyway. You wouldn't expect municipal governments. Yeah, exactly. So I don't want to... Like I said, they, they decentralize sensible things, and so the interesting, well, I'll, I'll get to the interesting point in a moment. Yeah. Just give me a year. I think before and after, we're talking about 94, 1994 is the year of the is the, is the, Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So this, this is data that, in fact, is clear here. 
So a second way in which we can look at the data is across space. So first across sectors, across uses of money, secondly across space. Um, and the database here is going from 1987. So this is, before 87 there is huge macroeconomic instability in Bolivia and the data just becomes wild and, and very sparse. Um, their hyperinflation was around 1985. So you know, pushing it back beyond 87 is, is almost impossible. Um, but we've got seven years, of, of seven years inclusive before the reform and then 13, 14 years inclusive after the reform. And the question is what did central, or where did central versus local governments invest in? And so you see that there's one place here that got 77,000 Bolivianos per capita. Now the average exchange rate is about five to the US dollar, right? And Bolivia is a very poor country. Bolivia is the poorest country in South America and, and, and it always vied, until recently it vied with Haiti for the poorest country in, in the Western hemisphere. Um, so this is a lot of money. In the 80s, this is a huge amount of money. Another place here got 42,000. This place got 21,000 Bolivianos per capita. And there are a lot of places down here that seem to be getting small, positive, but small amounts. Obviously, these very high um, observations are compressing the vertical axis. So down here, I just omit the top 12 so that I can expand the vertical axis and look at a bit more variation. And indeed, there is a bit more variation but the surprising thing is that if you count these dots, I, I should have said, each dot is muni a municipality's investment by central government exp uh, expressed in per capita terms, right? So each one of these dots is a, is a municipality in per capita terms. Central government chose to invest nothing in 40% of Bolivian municipalities during the seven years before decentralization. So I mean, one, of the, one of the pleasures of sitting in a symposium like this is that I can listen to people like Roger talking about um, what central, centralized or central politicians incentives and how they might behave. And in a sense, this is an empirical um, illustration of, of, of highly centralized incentives. The Bolivian government was very highly centralized before reform. Most municipalities didn't exist. All state governors were appointed a dedo in Spanish by the president. They were the president's men directly appointed and deposable instantly by the president whenever he wanted. And these are the decisions they took and they chose to invest nothing, as in mathematically 0.00, .00 year after year for seven years before the reform. And they were unconstrained. They could have done whatever they wanted. This is what they chose to do. After the reform, we see a far more equal distribution. Look, so this is, the, these curves ascend in periodicity. If, if you look at, if you spend as much time looking at the data as I have, you see that they're, they're very clear periods that have to do with broad macroeconomic changes largely with what Paul was talking about with, res with natural resource prices. So Bolivia in the late 90s and 2000s gets into the natural resource boom and they're making a lot of money from oil and minerals and they start to, they change the decentralization allocation from the strict per capita criterion to, um, to, to more royalties going to the places where the exploitation is and so the curve becomes more unequal, especially in this last period. But even this last curve is far less unequal than that was before, right? And in here what you see is basically the, the, the product of the per capita criterion, right? So this is not surprising. Th this is what we would expect to see. It, it's receipts were exactly one horizontal line. What this is plotting here is, is executions. So down here we have a few small municipalities that didn't have much capacity or were just terrified of, of being of being put in jail if they misspent the money because they didn't understand how the money should be spent or they were just sort of generally scared. And so down here, the reason that this is lower than that is simply that there's money building up in the bank accounts, right? But the point is that th there was extreme inequality before the reform and there's much less inequality afterwards. Now the, the third way that I want to try to describe what happens before versus after is to think in terms of some very simple proxies, some very sim simple indicators of need. Um, and I'm gonna use the illiteracy rate as an indicator of need for, for incremental investment in education. And the argument is what you would expect, it's very simple. In this municipality, let's, let's look at the, the, the outer extremes. In this municipality, about 85% of the population is illiterate, right? So about 15% of the adult population can read. And here, 7% is illiterate, so 93% can read. And so all I'm saying is that all else equal, this place needs more education investment than that place needs. 
probably it's Bolivia, so they all need education investment. But if you have to choose, you would, you would hope to see more investment here than there. And so uh, a progressive or a needs responsive line would be an upward sloping line like that, right? What do we see that central government did? This is central investment during the seven years before reform. Well, it's, it's a very funny graph, first of all, because you have one very high observation here and then others that are down there at a very low level. So we'll do the same trick and expand the vertical axis so we can see a little bit more detail. And it turns out there are more non-zero observations. But again, if you count all the, now they're blue, all the blue dots that are at exactly zero Bolivianos per capita year in, year out for seven years, you see that 85% of Bolivian municipalities got no investment in education under centralization. The center just decided not to invest a penny in 85% of Bolivian municipalities. One place got a large amount and other places got some, some non-zero amounts. The regression line, the, the trend line is negative, but it's not statistically significant. So really, there's, just, there's no relation between this, these proxies of need. And I've, I've tried different measures of illiteracy from different sources, according to UN definitions, according to Bolivian definitions, World Bank data. It all turns out exactly the same. Educational attainment among the adult population as opposed to the, it all works out exactly the same way. So I mean, I think it's very clear that this is what was going on. After reform, what are the decisions, the, the investment decisions that local governments made? Again, netting out what central government did or didn't do. And you see that the line is positive and statistically significant at the 1% level in both of these periods. And I mean, actually, the, the bigger finding is simply that here, in the first three years after reform, 97% of localities did invest in education. And in the following period, 100% of localities invested in education. So there's just there's much more responsiveness to, to this kind of need and there's much more activity in this sector that we think is important. Um, I'm not going to show you this evidence just for lack of time, but in, in the qualitative work, when I go around and I speak to, to, to poor people, especially to peasants, to, to rural people, to poor people who live in cities, and I ask them, what are your priorities? Everyone puts education in their top three. There's no doubt that poor people want more education because they realize that this is part of what they need for their children, I mean, not for themselves now, for their children to move on and, and make a better life. And so my broader argument in the book is that education is a high priority essentially everywhere in Bolivia and one kind of government was responsive and, and the other kind was not. So to summarize, what did decentralization seem to do descriptively? It seemed to shift public investment from production to human capital formation and primary services. These results, I, I haven't shown this to you, but these results are driven by smaller, poor, more rural districts. So if I start looking at where those blue dots are before and after, you see very clearly that the biggest changes are in the smaller, poor, more rural districts. It's not the big, sophisticated cities that have you know, lots of computers in their offices and people with master's degrees running the budget and doing oversight that improves significantly. It's the small rural places where lots of people cannot read that seem to be driving these results. There's much greater spatial equality, as you would expect, product of the per capita criterion. Um, and lastly, local government investments are far more responsive to local needs than central government. I'm, I'm not basing this on what I've just shown you, these sort of Mickey Mousey descriptive graphs. This, I, I have more serious quantitative work that, that establishes this a bit more seriously. Um, again, with the database including all Bolivian municipalities. So I want to dig down now and try to understand, well, the, the real agenda is not just to describe what happened, but to understand why you had results and why you had good versus bad results, to get back to Tim's question. Um, so let, let's talk about Bolivia in more detail now. Bolivia is, it's, it's a big country, it's twice, what, well, big by, maybe I should, by European standards, it's twice the size of France, but demographically it's only got the population of London in it, it's about 10 million people. It's very, very diverse. Um, so you, you go from 1,500 meters above sea level, and th that's the plain, not the peaks. The peaks are much higher, um, which is the area that was traditionally populated by the Inca and Empire and, and the people before that, Tiwanakota and the Aymara kingdoms um, in the west of the country. Traditionally, this is where the people were, and this is where the, the economy was focused and the administration. This is La Paz with the Imani behind it. Poverty rises as you go up the bowls of La Paz. So, so the, the main moneyed places and the center of government is down here, and then up on the edges, you, you have much poorer people. Mining activity is also there. This is from another one of my case studies in Atocha. This is a mining community 
that is about to be engulfed by the shadow of the mountain, and the mine is clockwise to the left round this peak. The, the entry to the mine is on that side. And this is what a, mine, a mining community looks like more close up. These things here that look like they could be um, sheds for tools are actually habitation units. These are houses that families live in. Um, and that's what the entry to the mine looks like and some of the mining equipment. This is informal sector wildcat mining since the state mining company collapsed, basically. You also have the huge eastern plain, which is enormous. Um, the, the, the land seems to go on forever and ever. It's an eventual lake, meaning that it's flooded for four months of the year, and so there aren't roads in these, these parts of the country. The, the, the city streets in these towns and villages look like this. This is downtown city street in Baudis. It's actually green. There's a path along the middle where people walk and the, the, the couple of mopeds in town, town and you know, donkeys and so on. But it's, except for the places where the city streets are actually rivers. Um, so very, very different. Here we're at about 200 meters above sea level. Very different sort of environment, different ethnicity, different language, very sort of different in, in almost every way that you can think of, different diseases, different public health and education challenges. Um, so I want to look at two places in particular. One is Viacha, up here on the Altiplano, on the main highway south from La Paz, and the other is Charagua, which is right where the Andes give out. And so Charagua has its back to the very last bits of mountain of, of the Andes, Andean chain, and then it looks out to the east over the great Chaco Plain, which is what the Chaco War was fought over in 1932 to 35 between Bolivia and Paraguay. Um, by the way, parenthetically, maybe one of the only wars, uh, with the exception maybe of the Balkans, that both sides are, are, are convinced they lost. So the Bolivians took a, a big chunk of, sorry, the Paraguayans took a big chunk of Bolivia here, but they didn't get the oil. The oil was there. So they were actually, they had taken it, but they got, they got beaten back, um, and, and the war ended in a stalemate there. So first, Viaggio on the Altiplano, it has some rural communities that look like this. And again, these are houses. And here's a child standing <coughs> outside her house. Um, and, and these are some of the people who live in these places. But it also has a big city, which is an industrial city, the 13th biggest city in Bolivia, that has a big cement factory, a big beer um, bottling factory, um, and a lot of medium-sized firms that make textiles. Charagua, down in the eastern plain, looks like this. So th that's the end of the Andes right there, and, it, and Charagua nudges up against it. This is one of the main streets um, in, in the town, which has a big agricultural zone. There's Daisy the cow wandering through the central square. Um, and this is the, the equivalent of the other village I showed you. Within the municipal space, this is a, a poor rural subsistence agriculture Guarani village, of which there, there are many strung out across a huge area. Now, sort of standard theories of public management would expect that you would get much better performance in Viacha than in Charagua because Viacha is very close to La Paz. It's actually integrated into the same big metropolitan area in the sense that you can walk from the southern extreme to La Paz straight to Viacha without leaving urbanized space. At no point do you... When I began my work, there was, there was a bit of rural land between the two, but now they're, they're really fused. More importantly, there's a good paved road from La Paz to Viaccia, which is a scarce kind of thing in Bolivia. And um, public transport goes back and forth from downtown Viaccia to downtown La Paz every 10 minutes. Every time one of those minibuses fills up, it takes off for La Paz and vice versa. Um, and it's, a, it's an industrialized, relatively big, relatively wealthy place by Bolivian standards. So they have more resources. And any time the mayor has a public management challenge, if he doesn't have local resources, he can dip into the labor pool in La Paz and get an architect, a, a participatory budgeting specialist, an engineer, any sort of person that he might need, he can simply get from La Paz. Um, meanwhile, Charagua is, is very poor, it's subsistence level agriculture. It's five hours by unpaved road from the nearest city, which is Santa Cruz. And this road is an impassable four months of the year during the rainy season. You literally cannot get to Charagua or out of Charagua for about a third of the year. Um, maybe most importantly, Charag was huge. It, it, if I were to trace the limits, it would look like that. It's 72,000 square kilometers. Does anyone have any sense of how big 72,000 square kilometers is? You could compare it to any place that you know. 72,000 square kilometers is two and a half size, times the size of Belgium. 
It's bigger than Holland, it's bigger than Costa Rica, it's three and a half times the size of Wales, for example. So this is a big place with 20, 22,000 people who live there and a main town in Charagua, which is where the administration is based, that has about 2,500 inhabitants. So it's a vast space with almost no one living there where the vast majority of people are subsistence level. Guarani speakers have been traditionally repressed, actively repressed by force of arms, by the Bolivian state and by local ranchers. Um, where physically getting from one side of the municipality to another is impossible three months of the year. There isn't a paved road in the whole place and again the, the roads are washed out. You could just about do it by helicopter but the mayor doesn't have a helicopter. So I mean governance challenges are big here and yet what I find is exactly the opposite of what that kind of standard view would predict. In Viacha, local government was unresponsive, violent and corrupt. The mayor actively sabotaged the institutions of local governance, of accountability, of transparency. Um, and, and they were in a real morass when I first went there. So, so as quick evidence, so you don't just believe me, the, with decentralization, the payroll expanded more than 100% without any offsetting increase in, in local government capacity. The, the local administration wasn't able to do one more thing than it had been able to do before, even though it doubled the payroll. A municipal coliseum which was unfinished and, and far over budget in 1996 when I first went there. And the last time I went back in 2009, it was still unfinished and massively more over budget because they kept, bits of it kept falling apart. They had to keep tearing it down and rebuilding it. There was a sewerage project where they dug up the, the old pipes and they put in new pipes. Um, the contract was given by the mayor to a, to a political ally who owned a construction company but the tubes that they put in under the streets of Viacha were too small in diameter and they were made of material that was too weak. And so the system literally exploded up onto the streets and it threw human waste up onto the streets and sidewalks of Viacha, leaving big craters in central streets that you could not drive around. Um, public officials, municipal councilmen and the mayor's political bosses all testified to me our problem is the mayor is corrupt. And by the mayor's political boss, I mean the head of his local political party said to me, my problem is this guy that I put into office has turned out to be corrupt. That's my problem. I don't know what to do about it. You, you're from the LSE. You can tell me what to do about it. Um, and a national audit charged the mayor with malfeasance. So why? Well, I have lots of testimony as well as primary evidence. So I'm convinced that the mayor was indeed corrupt. You had an ineffective municipal council. You might have thought the oversight committee that the reform had put into place might have helped to counteract this, but it was neutralized by the following strategy. The mayor simply fired, illegally fired, the president, vice president, and secretary of the correctly constituted oversight committee, and he exiled them from municipal offices, wouldn't give them any data, and basically chased them out of town. And then he hired his own people who were from a different region in Bolivia. They were from that mining region that I showed you pictures of. They're from the south in Potosí. And he hired them and paid them a salary to rubber stamp everything he did, which was strictly illegal, but he could get away with it because the rest of the system, not least because the municipal council was ineffective. They, they were a bunch of peasants. They were his political allies. They were in the same party. They didn't understand what they should be doing. I asked them in, a in an interview, why is your municipality running so badly? And they said, because we don't know what our duties are. Can you tell us what our duties are? And I said, uh, I could, but I don't think that's going to help you very much because you, you're evidently uninterested in, in uh, carrying out your duties. Um, so there was neither political nor social oversight of municipal activities. But th this, is kind of, this is kind of a dumb explanation. No? So the reason you had bad local government is that the mayor, the oversight committee, the municipal council were, were bad actors. Well, it doesn't tell us very much. So let's dig a little bit deeper into three broad categories, which are the local economy, local politics, and civil society to try to understand what was going on here. On the one hand, you had, the, you had one big dominant firm, which was the brewery, the, the Cervecería Boliviana Nacional Brewery, which was allied to the dominant political party in this place called the UCS. Allied, by that I mean that the founder, the owner of the brewery was also the founder of the political party, and the two were run as one highly integrated operation that had two main products, beer and politics. And this is literally the way that it happened. So you went to a, a, a rally in Viacha, and the speakers were on a platform and there were big banners over the speakers that said, vote for the UCS, drink Pasenia beer. <laughs> and the, the, the workers, um, in fact, the, 
So if I go back to these pictures, oh no, I took those pictures out, sorry. Okay, I slimmed it down just for speed. Um, the, 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 the workers who were working at any, one of these at any one of these rallies wore uniforms in the same color, the same blue and white colors, which were the colors of the, the brewery and also the political party. They gave out beer for free at the beginning of any rally, and then once the party got going, they began charging for it. But more importantly, the, the beer boss, who was also the politics boss, the head of the brewery in Viaccia was also the head of the local political party because he financed the whole operation. He put the assets and personnel of the brewery at the disposal of the party. If you think about those very poor communities that I showed you a couple of pictures of, what, what representatives, what visitors from you know, the modern world in Bolivia go there regularly and, and make a visit? It may be the teachers, it may not be the teachers, it's certainly not a doctor. They don't get a doctor's visit there almost ever. It's only politicians every four or five years at election time. The guy who turns up every Friday is the guy who drives a beer truck. And he, uh, up, he <coughs> downloads, he, he offloads new bottles of beer and he uploads the empty bottles of beer and he takes advantage to hand out political pamphlets and propagandize and maybe make some side agreements with the local leader or whatever. Um, and so it actually made sense, there was a sort of a, a, an advantage for this kind of company to be allied to politics and, and the, the alliance was very successful, not just in Viaccia but throughout the country. But then the brewery went out of his way to also corrupt the opposition political parties to non-compete. And I know this because I spoke to the head of the brewery who was also the head of the UCS political party and I spoke to the people he was corrupting and they all reported the same thing. So I asked the guy, how is it that you manage to maintain this dominance in this place? And he said, oh, the problem with you political scientists is that you're all stupid. You don't know anything. You know, you're lost in your theory. Here's how you do it. I went to the mirror who was challenging me in the last election because they had a really, a really good candidate. It's proportional representation, so you vote for a list. Their number one candidate was this nice, kindly doctor who's delivered you know, half the population of Viaccia. And I knew that my corrupt guy, this bastard, excuse me, that I, that I put into place was never going to win against the kindly doctor. So I went to the head of the mirror and I said, listen, if you, if you take him off the list and put in this guy Gonzalez on your list, I'm going to give you 10,000 US dollars. And if you don't take the money, not only you don't get, if not only uh, you're not going to get the money, but I'm going to screw you. I'm going to mess you up so badly, you're not going to know <coughs> what hits you, formally and informally. You're not going to be able to stop our campaign. You're going to be made to look ridiculous. Because, you know, let's be serious, you know and I know that your national political party doesn't care about you in Viaccia. So your only chance of being able to run a campaign and, and make a good show is if you take the money. But in addition, then, you can walk home at night in the darkness and not be afraid. And if you don't take the money, you know, I, I pity you. So he took the money. And I went and I spoke to him and I said, is this true? And he said, yes, well, in fact, the head of the brewery made a charitable contribution because he wanted to support political competition. So, of course, I took the money. And if you look at the electoral records, you see the kindly doctor suddenly drops off the list and he's replaced by this guy, Gonzalez, who everyone knew was corrupt. And the, the beer guy said, of course he's corrupt. That's the point. He's corrupt. That's why I want to be number one on your list. So you got politics, which was neutralized. There is very little political competition. There is no substantive political choice. And so in a period in Bolivia where voting totals are more than doubling, turnout goes up 127% after decentralization across the country, turnout in Viaccia drops by a third. Um, you might have thought civil society might be able to do, if you're a Putnamite especially, maybe you know, social capital or civil society can do something about this. It turns out in Viaccia it was highly divided between people in the city, sophisticated urbanites who consider themselves white, Western, European, inspired, and modern versus the indigenous sort of barbaric rural countryside. And then the countryside was itself, which was a majority, was itself divided between one region, the Machacas, which had traditional forms of organization that go back to pre-Inca times, the Ayus and Maikus, and the rest of the countryside, which had taken on board the, the social forms of organization of, of the Bolivian Revolution, of the, the, the Nationalist Revolution in 1952. So they had peasant workers' unions as their form of organization. And these two were just at loggerheads. And you had episodic violence and, and um, persistent collective action problems. So how about Charagua? Charagua facing all these big sort of structural and geographic impediments. In fact, they had a local government which was participative, responsive, 
led by strong organizations of government that produce high quality policy. So again, as quick evidence, the mayor topped a departmental ranking when they, with decentralization, this was a small place that got very little money before. They had a, they had a net resource shock, a positive resource shock of 6,500%. This is how much their budget increased with reform, but they kept operating costs to 4% of the budget. So they didn't do what Viaccia did. They didn't go and hire everyone and his brother. Um, the same national government audits that condemned Viaccia, applauded Charagua, and local testimony. This is the only place I went to in all of my casework where local testimony was overwhelmingly positive, even where people disagreed with particular policy priorities. Nobody accused the government of, of, of being corrupt or of malfeasance or of, of being ineffective. Everyone said it's a good, effective, hardworking government. God, I wish they'd do more in our village instead of the village next door. Or really, they're doing too much for rural education. They need to do more on roads or irrigation. But nobody, nobody objected to the competence or, uh, or probity of the government. Honest, hardworking mayor, a good municipal council, and this time an oversight committee which is vigilant and independent. But again, these are sort of dumb, dumb reasons or dumb causes. So deeper causes. The local economy consisted of pluralistic ranchers, right? So ranching by its nature is our family businesses, and family businesses are independent units which might ally in political terms or in class-based terms, but they're still independent units unlike a really big company that employs lots of people and dominates uh, the local economy. And different ranchers supported different political parties. And even when they even supported, or in this, they even contributed to political parties, which they themselves did not vote for. So I, most of these people are for the center MNR or the right wing ADN party in terms of their preferences. At least that's what they told me. Um, but many of them admitted to the form that political competition takes in this bit of the world is you give a cow, you contribute a cow to a political party. And then in this rural area, they slaughter the cow, they have a barbecue, they invite people to come and they give speeches, right? That's how you do a campaign in, in, uh, in the Chaco. And so these ranchers told me, yeah, well, you know, I vote for the ADN, but along came the, the left revolutionary movement, the Mir, and I gave that guy a couple of cows too, because, you know, you never know, he might win. I mean, and he's a nice guy. And, you know, so I gave three cows to my party, but I gave two cows to this guy. You know, that's fine. And so what you have then is this structure of the local economy or this, this attitude of, of the local agents supporting an open competitive political system, which was open to new entrants. And the best example of that is the following. When the municipal borders got expanded to include that huge rural Guarani area that, that, uh, that abuts Paraguay, um, the majority, because before the, the municipality really consisted of the town. And so the, the white people, the educated people, and the, the, um, the cattle ranches were in the majority. When the borders got expanded, the huge Guarani rural, uh, the, 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 it's not huge, but the, the majority of the population became Guarani and rural. So of the 20 odd, 25,000 people, um, 22 and a half thousand people are, are rural subsistence Guarani farmers they became the, the natural majority of this municipality before they had never voted. They were actively excluded from voting because they didn't have identity papers, they, didn't, they, they weren't registered to vote, um, and voting areas, voting, to uh, sorry, voting booths, voting, what do you call them, voting stations, what do you call, where do you go to vote? Polling. Polling places, thank you, thank you. Polling places were all in the town, and this place is twice, two and a half times the size of Belgium. So, you know, rural Guarani people just never got to vote. Um, so, so along came this left revolutionary movement, the same people who were corrupted in Viacha, um, led by some, some left-wing university graduates from the, the, the nearest city, from Santa Cruz. And they went and they spoke to Guarani leaders and they said, listen, you guys are now the majority. You should win any election. You need to do two things. You need to make sure your people are registered and you need to get them to vote. And if you like, two minutes, okay, if you like, what we will do is you choose the politician that you would like, that you would like to, to lead our list and we'll put our t-shirt on him. The saying in Spanish is le ponemos la camiseta. We'll put a t-shirt on him that says Mir with our political party insignia. We'll induct him into the party very rapidly and he'll head our list and then you guys get the vote out for him. We'll negotiate a platform and this will be good for you. And they did that and they won and they walked into power in a place where they had never won more than 5% of the vote. They suddenly won the election and, and stepped into government. So this is an example of political entrepreneurialism 
that le leads to broad representation because you have an open, substantively competitive political system. And what facilitated that was a structured, coherent civil society wi with high, I have used the dreaded phrase, with high social capital or, or um, high levels of legitimacy. You have an organization called the APG, which is a, a big civic group rooted in traditional Guarani village practices that acted as an ethnic advocate for these people. And so when the Mir came down to, to negotiate with the Guarani speakers, they had an organization they could speak to. They had natural leaders who spoke for the Guaranis, who solved collective action problems, and who could communicate information upwards and downwards in terms of what their preferences were. And so the Guaranis reacted positively to that in the sense that they went and they voted and these people won. Um, so just to, to, to close, get away with calling this a theory in comparative politics seminars. I have no illusions that this constitutes a theory for economists. So let me just, if, if you object to that word, just ignore it, please. Um, this, this is a sort of a, a conceptualization or a, a framework for thinking about what's going on. If the question is, how can we explain where local government is responsive and accountable and where it's not? It seems to me the, the primary determinant of that is open substantive competition in politics. But this is not exogenous. It's not fixed for different localities. It is itself endogenous to what? <coughs> I think to these two things. On the one hand, economic interests, lobbying, and political engagement. And on the other hand, civil society's organizational density and ability. It is simply an empirical regularity that some places in a country like Bolivia or Colombia or Ecuador or other places that I've, that I've studied, you have local societies that have many active organized groups and other places that don't, where local society is more atomized and you don't have the intermediating structures. Um, and you have some local economies that are dominated by one big actor or where you have a number of actors that have more heterogeneous interests. And so where you have heterogeneous economic actors that engage with a more organized civil society and they engage through politics, political competition will tend to be more open and more competitive in, on substantive issues as opposed to beauty contests or as opposed to gift giving. In, in Viaccia, they gave away blue buckets uh, to, in, in exchange for votes. And that will lead to more responsive and accountable government. Um, and I, I try to test this empirically, and it seems to work out, but I think we should just stop there because I've run out of time. Yeah, OK. We do the time, I think that's the extent. I just had a set of questions for the panel. Absolutely. Thank you.